Lyman, Breakthrough with the Mirror Man. Melvin Lyman was born on March 24, 1938. Zodiac Lee speaking he was an Aries. He grew up in Oregon and it was there that he attended a junior college. He moved to California and was married in 1955 at the age of 17. He then took a job as a computer technician. It wasn't long before he became disillusioned with the conventional lifestyle and in 1961 he quit his job and began a quest for meaning of a more substantial nature. He settled in Asheville, North Carolina, and through Bray Ramsey mastered his technique on the banjo. It was through these travels that he developed a network of like-minded individuals. Lyman was a student of human nature and at this point had acquired an innate understanding and a search for meaning within his life and aimed at improving the human condition. Initially it was through music that he was able to connect with his spiritual center. Lyman began his communal living experiment in spring 1963 living near Brandeis College in Waltham, Massachusetts. He appeared to have come from an Appalachian background with a simplicity and earthy demeanor and was dressed casually in an army jacket. He was quite adept on his numerous harmonicas and also upon the banjo. It was at this early juncture that Lyman became an acid therapist as a guide-slash-mentor of LSD trip sessions. He had an innate understanding of how to get into the mind of the acid experimenter and had the ability to release the stored pain and suffering to allow the energy to flow unimpeded. During this time he acquired a charisma which accelerated his already dynamic personality to become a force of nature. He would advise the LSD experimenters to see him after they had been tripping for five hours. It was at that point that he was able to have untrammeled access to their deepest psyche and was free to impart his unorthodox therapeutic methodology. From 1963 to 1964 Mel Lyman frequented Timothy Leary's Newton Center. He became quite proficient both as a participant in the LSD experience and as a guide during these sessions. In his studies of cosmic consciousness he came to the realization that he was God, or in other words he achieved that uppermost vibrational level which signifies God consciousness. Through these experiences he gained significant understanding and illumination and realized a greater purpose in his life. He had a singularity of the focus of his will and gained the ability to transform his environment through sheer intent and the power of his mind. It was a role which Mel felt uniquely prepared to inhabit. He had the certitude and determination to have achieved the highest levels of conscious awareness. One aspect of the mental processing involved in guided LSD sessions was to build up the ego of the individual so they were able to see themselves as a superior being and one who was able to transform the world by becoming a transmitter of Mel's philosophy. He gave them a strength to become empowered yet fostered reliance upon himself as their foundation and as a beacon of wisdom. After leaving North Carolina he sent his first wife Sophie to the West Coast. His second wife Judy came apart under the pressure which was perhaps a combination of the powerful LSD trips combined with the dynamics of Mel's intense lifestyle. She moved back to Kansas in the summer of 1963. This is emotionally reflected in Mel's journals of this period and was published in Mirror at the end of the road. Mirror offers a glimpse into the formative years of Lyman's life, fully examining his times of self-doubt and isolation and provides an insight into his later stature as soul of the world. Shortly after Judy left, Mel was hired by Jim Queskin to play banjo in his jug band Amalgamation. By this point Queskin had become a big draw for Harvard undergrads in Club 47 located in Cambridge, which was the center of the burgeoning folk music movement. Within a short time Mel became the spiritual essence within the band due to his compelling nature and uncompromising vision. In 1965 at the Newport Folk Festival, Mel played a 20-minute heartfelt rendition of Rock of Ages as the audience began to file out. The symbolic gesture made a wordless statement of sending waves of unity to the audience, 
who had become disillusioned that day as Bob Dylan sold out to the folk music purists as he gave an electrified rock music performance. It was an impulsive move as he stepped back onto the stage alone. In a sense he felt compelled to do this as a means of accepting responsibility by manifesting a soul-bearing performance. During Mel's developmental phase he discovered the divine nature in music. It was through the Jim Queskin Jug Band that he was able to concentrate this ability to transfer thought forms within these transmissions to affect the consciousness of listeners and requiring them to feel in a deeper, more profound level than ordinary music demands of the listener. When approaching a recording or video production it was of utmost importance to create consciously or in other words harness the spirit by spontaneously incorporating the energy of others participating in the recording thereby becoming able to tap into the source of inspiration projecting from the higher self to effortlessly allow the creativity to flow forth. Mel wrote that there is always an order in life. Life is the reflection of that order as man is the reflection of God. It takes a long time to find the meaning in our day-to-day -day activities but in reflection we will always detect the moving finger that traced the pattern we have followed, there is a plan. Every man is his own unique part of the plan, every life has a purpose. Lives that seemingly were lived with no kind of purpose at all might have simply served the purpose of distinguishing purpose by lack of purpose, it all fits together in some crazy way. Mel becoming the unspoken leader of the Queskin Jug Band lead them on an entirely different course than would have evolved had he not been a part of the band. It brought them into many tenuous situations in the performer slash audience dialectic. The band was concerned with channeling the energy of those in the audience. Oftentimes these concert goers were confused and hostile to the fact that at the beginning of the show they were met with a mute band who waited an interminable length of time before they sensed some sort of connection to flow between them and the audience before they would deem it fit to begin playing. They were sometimes met with sermonizing upon the virtues of Mel Lyman by Jim Queskin before the show got underway. From Queskin's perspective the anger emanating from the crowd formed the union or magical link with them, which enabled them to feel and at this juncture a connection had been made so it would be possible to play. It was a dictum of Mel's that through a destructive act a symbiosis was established which could lead to a deeper understanding. By experiencing emotional pain, anger, isolation or confusion and then overcoming it would lead to a greater perception of truth. Lyman's message was that people have to live with their loneliness, pain and suffering and within that framework they should focus on work to improve the situation. The philosophy Mel utilized when it came to music recordings was to allow for spontaneity and he approached it with conscious intent. The focus was to capture the inspirational spirit. This is especially evident with the UI band recordings as well as Birth which exudes an eerie late night vibe. He drew people to Fort Hill through his writings in Avatar later American Avatar. It was there that they learned Hill philosophy, Mel's unique perspectives upon dealing with life to fulfill one's potentiality. The Hill congregation were constantly involved in the hard labor of construction on the many Fort Hill properties and further manifesting Mel's message to the world through a variety of media. They were constantly under a pressure by higher level members which served to transform them into accepting personal responsibility for the propagation of the philosophy of the Lyman family and catering to its continued prosperity. It was Mel's column in Avatar magazine entitled To All Who Would Know which reveals an insightful look into the Lyman philosophy. Astrology was an important methodical science utilized heavily within the Lyman family and its use revealed great insights into motivations of family members as well as outsiders based upon their astrological attributions. He also had a cantankerous, adversarial side and when it came to a battle of wills Mel was completely unrelenting. On one occasion he was served with an eviction notice in Boston, so he chose to stay on the property for months merely out of the principle. 
When Mel took interest in an individual who came to him for advice he was able to provide for them a greater sense of importance and depth of purpose in understanding one's life. His pragmatic yet mystical approach penetrated their deepest psyche. Mel radiated an intensity which was unmeasured in any other sort of human interaction. One early girlfriend of Mel's during the early formative period of the Lyman family was Jessie Benton who was the daughter of Thomas Hart Benton, the famous and quite wealthy artist. It was through Jessie that Mel acquired a property on Martha's Vineyard which was used as a retreat. Eventually the Lyman family developed a corporate entity known as United Illuminating Incorporated. It was through Avatar that many people first came to hear about Mel. Avatar was named after Mary Baba who was often referred to as the Avatar of the Age. Originally it was a Boston underground newspaper which was run by both members of the Lyman family and non-members from the counter-cultural scene. Mel never frequented the office of Avatar and wasn't actually on the editorial board, but he was the spiritual presence behind the paper and often contributed his writings as did many others from the Lyman family. Avatar later augmented its format issues 18 to 23, so that it had an outer section comprised of news from the underground, and an inner supplementary section devoted to the writings of Mel. Its contents also included other news and writings from members of the Fort Hill community. He quickly became a contentious figure in the Boston area while simultaneously becoming an underground celebrity. Avatar began publication in 1967 and its first few issues were published from the Broadside magazine headquarters. When it came time to publish issue 24 Mel instigated a spiritual war with the non-Lyman family element of the paper. This led to a schism on issue 25. All except about 1,000 copies of the 45,000 copies were stolen by angry Lyman family members. After the fallout a lavishly printed magazine called American Avatar was published. There were a total of four issues which were released from October 1968 to summer 1969. Mel was able to attract a number of influential personalities to the Lyman family philosophy. The most notable example of course is Jim Queskin who lived his life to fulfill the needs of Mel Lyman. Other notable people within the fold include, Paul Williams who was quite famous as a rock journalist for Cry Daddy, Owen DeLong who was a former speech writer for Robert Kennedy, Don West an assistant to the CBS president, and Mark Frechette who starred in the Antoinini film Zabriskie Point. Paul Williams was actively involved within the family but eventually became dismayed by having to start at the bottom rung of Lyman's evolutionary system despite his prestige as an acclaimed writer. Richard Herbrook was the producer of the Lyman family and in fact was the alter ego of Mel. He produced many productions including the Jim Queskin's America album. Mel's first book autobiography of a world savior Jonas Press, 1966 was published by underground filmmaker Jonas Mekos. It began as a fable with sci-fi overtones and was written as an inside joke for several Scientologist friends of his. The introduction is quite illuminating and provides an insight into Mel's mindset at the time. Loneliness is the sole motivation, the force that keeps man striving after the unattainable, the loneliness of man separated from his soul, man crying out into the void for God man eternally seeking more of himself through every activity, filling that devouring need on whatever level the spirit is feeding, the arena of conflict, be it flesh, thoughts, aspiring to ideals, man searches for love to satisfy his gaping hunger, an ever increasing hunger because the spirit devours flesh, exhausting every last outpost of hope and the conquest must always necessarily search for higher ground. The only pain is separation and the only joy is breakthrough and the battle only really begins when man has finally, through exhaustion, worn out every tangible means, devoured everything in sight and arrived right back where he started with an empty belly and a world with no food, having cried all of his tears and standing completely naked and alone knowing full well that there is no comfort outside of himself. 
that he must walk that lonesome valley be why himself with no kind words, no friendly faces, no helping hands, only then does one begin to fully realize the meaning of utter loneliness, it's difficult, it's the most difficult stage a man will ever have to face and it is inevitable that all will someday have to face themselves and make the terrible decision. Few have ever succeeded as yet and those few we call world saviors, our enlightened leaders who threw themselves unresistingly into the black void, learned the meaning of faith, and in time found a light, their own inner light, and with that light they forever tempt us to follow. In the opening paragraphs of Autobiography Mel states that he was sent on a mission to the earth to raise the vibrational spirit of every living being. In this book Mel states that there are three stages in the evolution of the mind of man. The first was called the concrete mind which dealt with the ability to manipulate one's environment on the material plane to satisfy their needs. The second stage is the abstract mind. The second race of man purposely saw to not concern themselves with the material level whatsoever and was more consciously fixated within their own imaginings. The third stage was a unification between the concrete and the abstract mind which harmoniously balanced the intellect with one's desires and was a path to spiritual fulfillment. In Lyman system adversity only strengthens a man's character. This is one reason he chose to relate the many introspective journal entries during the travels of his youth in Mirror at the end of the road. His role was to manipulate members to become what they were in order to eliminate institutional conditioning and dig down to the core of the personalities. When Lyman interacts one-on-one -on -one or with a group of people he follows a process where he will wait for a need to surface before he begins a transaction. He has remained silent during interviews for over an hour waiting for the need to become apparent. Once the interaction becomes on a personal level the fronts and preconceived perceptions can be eliminated and intensive communication can begin. When he begins a performance with his band there is always initially a separation between Mel and the audience. From his perspective merely to begin entertaining is false because it denies the separation and chooses to create a superficial unity. By waiting until the interaction gets to a visceral, emotional level of personal unity can occur. This approach is a way of perceiving from a consciously creative perspective by entering into an unknown situation where anything may possibly occur. By opening the door to the unknown dimension a true transfer of energy can freely occur without any sort of pretense or artifice. This is a discovery for both parties involved and while it is a potential risk, the exchange transcends the known limitations and expectations. This is the heart of true creativity. Part of the induction into the Lyman family involves being placed in uncomfortable situations to force the individual to use their intuition to overcome the obstacles which impede their progress. The fundamental approach the family took was based upon the necessity that arose at any given moment and how they could serve to satisfy this need most efficiently. This primarily consisted of group members striving to meet any requirement that Mel may have demanded at any given moment. Many television documentaries were produced by Lyman family members. Mel even went so far as wanting to take over CBS and formative plans were actually made toward this goal. The family operated within a crucible, a conversation quickly devolved into a confrontation which magnified the apparent indiscretions until the internal geek cracked under the pressure. Secrets weren't tolerated and it was strictly limited to a group dynamic where everyone's motivations were transparent. Life was approached communally and any sort of separatist mentality was quickly nipped in the bud particularly any coupling or personal relationships which didn't have official sanction from Mel or higher up members. At group dinners bulletins were read which were instructions and words of wisdom imparted by Lyman. The Karma Squad was an elite security team within the Lyman family whose presence was a constant reminder to anyone whose transgressions worked against the aims of the family. One of their responsibilities was to make people feel when they showed signs of repressing their true underlying emotions. 
It was also the responsibility of family members to share their understanding of Mel's message with fellow family members so that they could all be in accord when it came to applying the principles of Lyman's methodology. They were expected to profoundly have understood Mel's writings and truly have grasped the meta meanings beyond the plethora of discourses which Mel regularly imparted to his followers. A person must first embrace the pain of existence before they are able to feel anything beyond it. To live a meaningful existence man must approach life as an endless quest to perfect oneself to the level of becoming a living example of the truth upon which Mel sermonized and living consciously in the now. It is a constant struggle to live at this emotionally raw level of existence and is a lifelong endeavor. Members of the Fort Hill community were emblematic of these aspirations and their unorthodox approach was underlain by a pragmatic spiritual zeal which strove against complacency and sought to fully integrate one's highest aspirations as a living testament to the form of God which Mel radiated. One aspect of Mel's statement that he was God was not to be merely regarded as an overblown ego of megalomaniacal dimensions, but rather was sincerely earnest and concerned with living his life as an example, as one who is wholly focused on spiritual pursuits while being very much a part of the material world simultaneously. In the sense Mel was a mirror man who was a reflection of one's own attempts to unite with the higher self and living in a perpetual state seeking to attain this goal. Mel was able to destroy illusions of the self, so that the true self was able to be nurtured and have the possibility of evolution. He found that this was his calling to wake people up in the Gurdjieffian sense. To quote Mel, I'm out to transform the kind of pride that destroys transformation and destroy the kind of pride that transforms destruction. Got it? Mel Lyman died in April, 1978 of causes which remain unknown to all except the Fort Hill community members. The exact nature has never been disclosed to the public. It has been suggested that he may have suffered a long-term malady which progressively worsened. There was no actual death certificate or funeral service. There has even been speculation that Mel may have faked his own death to evade public scrutiny and move to Europe. One of Mel's last writings are indicative of his impending death. I know I'm done and I'll stop keeping that body alive it really is a lot of dead weight and I don't feel it's got much more use, do you know what I'm saying? I was Emerson, I was Lincoln. I was Woody Guthrie and many more but only for short periods of time and I used those instruments because they were ready for me and I used Mel Lyman in the same way and I'm nobody, I just am. Don't be sad, I'll be Mel Lyman as long as I can and in fact I may bring him back with a bang and light him up like a neon bulb and if I don't it's because it wasn't and if I do we will have a real Melvin Christ on our hands.